one of the co-curators of the festival, together with Tom Zeller. This is the four, fourth out of five conversations that will that have been and are taking place over the course of this festival. Um, the model of the festival this year is failure, and we're trying to explore the importance and meaning of it for the creative process, but also the challenges and pressure that come along with the expectations and the imminent threat of failure. About half a year ago, um, we organized an event here at the Seagull Theater on the current state of the contemporary dance in New York. And together with Andre Zachary and Tommy Griegsman, we invited about 13 choreographers to present their manifestos. Um, Kate Watson Wallace was one of them, and she talked about care and care for yourself and for your community. And we thought that that would be a, a perfect um, response to how to create a space and um, that, that uh, embraces uh, the creative process and also the experiment. So it's my great pleasure. To, uh, we asked Kate if she wanted to um, be with us here at Prelude to uh, um, present, to do a panel about uh, the topic of care. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Kate Watson Wallace. Hello. <laughs> it feels funny to use a microphone, but, <laughs> but anyways. Um, welcome, thank you for coming. Um, so I'm really excited about this conversation. I've asked three colleagues here, um, Marissa Perel, Corey Langhouse, and Luciana Hachugar, to um, just come today to talk a little bit about their own artistic practices in relationship to ideas of care. Um, and then just to have an open conversation um, at the end of that about what that actually means now in New York as artists, as dance artists, as artists working in the body in relationship to self-care um, and also in relationship to creating a larger culture of care. Um, so, so much to say about this, but I think we should start and they can tell you a little bit about themselves and present on the work, and we're going to start with Marissa. Thank you, Kate. Oh, okay. Hello. Hi. Sorry. Um, this feels really official, even though it's really a handful of us that are here. And I was wondering if there was a way that we could dim the lights a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Okay, now I can see everyone. And um, could you bring up the screen? Oh, oh no, I meant, um, <laughs> can I play video from the computer on the screen? Um, anyway, I could use this as a moment to say that I don't know the name of the tech person who's behind there who's doing a form of labor for all of us right now by doing all of this in a rushed way, probably 12 hours all day today or longer. So a form of care is being able to recognize everything that has to happen for us to be here. One of them is Kate, one of them is Antje, one of them is this person up here. Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm gonna, this is my website, basic thing, my website. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about care in the context of how I make my work and how I see making work. Uh, so, in my bio I talk about um, pretty much how I feel that um, function is form. And so as a person with a, a disability, I use that as a form. So the way that I function in my body is also a form in my work. Um, and I do see identity as, as formation and as a form for work. So all of the performances we're about to see this evening with 
Luciana as well, I would encourage you to think about how the identities of the artists um, might themselves be a form. And how are you and your I identity um, understanding that form? And how are you not able to because of your difference? That's a question I would ask. Um, I wanted to play a few minutes of this performance that I did with Greg Bordowitz. Um, we were commissioned by uh, the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act to create a performance for the Chicago Humanities Fe Festival last year. And it was about the intersection of disability and AIDS survivorship to actually pass the ADA. Um, and so we came together to talk about our difference and whether or not we actually felt held by the labels that we are given. Um, but what we did with each other was we uh, had conversations with one another and then we swapped. So he performed being me and I performed being him. So I'm gonna play the first few minutes of that, which is um, Greg being me.
So there's that. Um, and then there's, uh, I also feel freedom to choose how I'm going to navigate things from day to day, like, like how I inhabit my body, how I inhabit my pain, whether I use a cane. Um, The attitude of that at the moment, how I inhabit gender on a given day, uh, how those things intersect, when I need to say no to something. Um, how to watch the world happen sometimes without feeling like a player in that world. <laughs> So that's something about me through Greg. Um, then I also just wanted to share um, this funny little lecture performance I've been doing recently called Despair Solo, having to do with some of these themes. If I can see what I'm doing, if you're seeing me, however. Can I just present? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to make the connection between choreography and disability. And I'm trying to make a connection between the, form, the function of my body, the form of my work, choreography as a form. And what, what I can do if I can't um, like move the way a dancer is expected to move. Um, so I just wanted to like show how ar arbitrary some of our thinking is in the world about what choreography actually is, which you can read up here. A choreographer is one who creates choreographies by practicing the art of choreography, a process known as choreographing. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's terribly enlightening for all of us. <laughs> Um, and then I just, you know, actually the, the definition of this word is dance writing. Um, so it, what it means to put a form of the body into language and what it would mean to read that body, like reading a language. So if you think about it like that, some languages you will be able to read because you share that and some you won't. Some bodies you will be able to, to read because you might be able to relate, and some you won't. But that, that doesn't necessarily mean your inability to read that body renders the body invalid. Um, and then I just wanted to close with, um, I was invited to give a manifesto for a different kind of panel uh, over a year ago by Ava Ya Asentua. Um, that was based on a manifesto that Miguel Gutierrez wrote in like 2002 for the movement Re research 
performance journal. And I came up with a manifesto called I Want, I Vomit. And I want was just like a list of things that I want in the world. And I vomit was like a list of things I vomit on about how the world actually works. Uh, but I, um, I opened the article with these words. I love your body. I love your body even if I don't understand it. I love your body even if I am afraid of it. I love your body even if you don't love it. I love what you are showing me, even if I hate it. Because you are here in front of me, because you have chosen to be this, to move like this. Because you chose this life, and so did I, and we create the space for each other to exist. This is Greg's book. So uh, anyway, I'm just gonna end with that, and uh, thank you. All right, so I'm Corey Olinghouse, and maybe we could bring that link up that I sent you, thank you. So I'm gonna read a little bit and introduce you all to a practice I've been developing called clown therapy. And I'm just gonna allow this to play as I talk. Feel free to look at this and not at me at all. <laughs> all right. So clown therapy has been a practice that I've been developing since 2014 with two of my very dearest friends and collaborators, Neil Beasley and Ava Schmidt. And when we first started working together, we approached these practices not as rehearsals, no money is exchanged during them. And I was playing with modeling these practice sessions after some of what I had witnessed in the New York City underground. Uh, <laughs> oh, maybe we could turn the volume off on this, actually. <laughs> She, she's attacking me. Okay. So, part of what I had modeled this after were some of what I had witnessed by going to uh, open sessions in the underground house community and um, thinking of creating different kinds of spaces of social practice where people can come together and self organize and um, essentially practice whatever form they're engaged in. And so clown therapy for me is a little bit of a group therapy practice, meant in somewhat of a tongue-in-cheek way, uh, but also in a kind of deeply genuine way. Um, I think of it as kind of a portraiture practice. We do a series of self-portraits for one another um, that play with the idea of this shape-shifting nature of identity and personhood. And we work with costume and dress up as a kind of wearable sculpture. And there's something about working with costume in that way that allows us to feel concealed and that invites a space for misbehaving. And so stream of consciousness becomes this navigational lens that we use to enter all of our sessions. And there's two ideas from Clown that I've kind of loosely borrowed for this practice. And one is the idea of using a dog brain or a soft brain. And that goes in keeping with, you know, playing with aspects of humor and parody. And also something that emerged for me was, was myself as a child playing drag. And so entering into these pleasurably regressive states and allowing whatever repressed voices um, or identities were not allowed to exist come, to come forward. And in that way, playing with identity as a kind of fiction and moving along these slippery spectrums. And so one thing that started to emerge as we were working together uh, is we started to name some of the states that were uh, coming out of our movement portraits for each other. And so I'm just gonna read these as a kind of list. Scary happy clown, needs not being met clown, shade clown, grotesque clown, 
And then we start to mix these states. So things like disgruntled, mellow clown, giddy, gloomy clown, baby work drag clown, can't be bothered clown, lost, distra lost distraught clown. And this, is, this one is particularly, I have an affinity to this one, toxic sugar clown. Socially awkward, no filter clown. No boundaries clown. Okay, so you get the idea. Um, another thing we did is we printed a list off the internet that was called an inventory of feelings list. This was kind of strange. We started playing with um, entering into these different states and playing with mashing them up, very much looking at spectrums and ideas of contradiction. And something that I love is this idea of disaffinities. So um, I think the portrait where the, where the girl was attacking me with her chair, that was, that was this like sweet, sugary, um, sweet girl who was enraged. And that comes a lot. That's my toxic sugar clown. <laughs> so all right, so then just kind of on another note, this morning as I was preparing to come here, I was listening to the radio, and I was in the, in the other room, and I overheard someone saying, at the end of the world, there's just going to be rats and Twinkies. And what was interesting for me about that is my grandmother, every day for breakfast, ate a Twinkie and Dr. Pips from the Piggly Wiggly in Texas. And she just passed away, she was 94. And, and my father passed away in a town where there was only a liquor store and a Wonder Bread factory. And I grew up eating spoons of white sugar from a box <laughs> with dark circles under my eyes as this kind of child grump. And so these are things that, I've, that have really been coming through my body in the practice, um, excavating a series of these characters that have to do with um, having ingested parts of our culture uh, that play with fakeness, sugariness, kind of consuming American ideals of, of, of the sugary sweet. My family is from the South, so. And then my partner uh, works with middle school children and has been reading a book called The Good Girl Syndrome. And that's something I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, also in relationship, I don't know if you guys remember that uh, 1954 novel, The Bad Seed. And so Rhoda, eight years old, Rhoda Penmark, eight years old, she has these long blonde braids and she's charming and polite and obedient and well-groomed and compliant and all these things and she's a child murderer. And so this idea of this like terror of niceness. So in this practice, uh, part of what we do is we give space to different kinds of internalized trauma and we enter into our internal states as landscapes, looking to find a new kind of body to enter or a new form. And playing with the idea of entering these forms as a kind of shape uh, or a distorted likeness of a persona we're parodying, parodying. And I found this as a way to externalize the array of internalized behaviors, belief systems, oppressive postures, performed identities that we embody, and to move into these disjunctive or hybridized um, bodies, where we get to play with ambiguity, ambiguity and irreverence. And I find that there's a kind of relief that starts to happen as we move into these exaggerated silhouettes, uh, where humor and wit start to become these strategies for navigating darkness, and also creating a kind of distance. And so on many levels, clown therapy is this practice of making cartoons. Um, and on some level, what has started to emerge is this idea that our authentic selves are perhaps constructed, shape-shifting cartoon selves. Thank you. <laughs> I think 
Hello. Okay. I think I'm also just going to start playing. No, I'll, st I'll talk and then I'll. Um, it's okay. After hearing all that, I feel like um, there's so much that you've been talking about already that I can identify with and relate to and how I've been working. But um, when Kate asked us to do this, I was thinking about the idea of care and curing, healing, and um, I, I guess I would go, I, I guess I would start more for me kind of describing chronologically how it's to, I started to think of or to be more conscious how already making work, being involved in, I, I, I guess I would argue making art in general, but making dances particularly, it's, I, um, there was a point where I started to realize that it was, that really what I was trying to do is a kind of self-healing, that, that within the practice of dancing there is a desire to cure oneself, uh, I guess, or kind of exercise this kind of, if, just to use the language of disease, because because the idea of caring somehow to me takes me to health, and so um, the idea of health not as a not as a way of not as a balance, cleanliness, and this kind of Puritan idea of health, but more the idea of of being ridding oneself from something that feels toxic or. Uh, that doesn't feel good, <laughs> uh, that feels unnatural or not connected. Uh, anyway, I'm not gonna try to define that. <laughs> uh, dancing feels, to dance, the, pr the practice of being embodied. Dance has turned more and more for me into just the practice of being a body. And the questions about that, kind of how you were saying, about function and form, I guess. Um, so I started to become more conscious of the fact that for me, dancing wasn't about creating a thing for people to look at, but actually about a practice that is more therapeutic as well. So uh, in terms of uh, making something and, and its relationship to an audience, um, I mean, there is the practice of in the studio, like you were showing, and and how that that notion of thinking of, of or not just thinking, but practicing dance as this healing thing, shifts the relationship with the dancer for me, and the relationship uh, I was from the get go being a director, a choreographer. Uh, I there was something in that really power dynamic of dancer to choreographer that I felt a discomfort with and a, the power structure of that and that, that, that there was something within it that was too similar to something that I was trying to undo through dance, meaning there is a, in society a kind of hierarchy where um, the one in power tends to be the one with the idea, the one that is more rational, less embodied, or I mean, I'm simplifying, but there is a kind of structure within our society like that. And, and, I, and I started to make, I was making dances where the dancers were wearing uh, navy blue uniforms, like work, I was making this relation between, um, parallel between the dancer being the working class, like the dancer being the one that is lesser or less valued, pay, gets paid less, you know, has to more, ton of jobs in order to be able to dance, gets injured, etc., to make the work happen. It's kind of the factory worker in the sense of the, the model of making dance, of the making dances model. So I, there's a discomfort in that when I start being the choreographer because I'm against, you know, like when you talked about, you know, person, <laughs> work, the labor involved in it, you know. So there's this, within our own bodies there's that hierarchy of like what do we value and how do we care how we e even ourselves we 
you know, will will won't listen to the, you know, like you were talking about, like, do I go out? What's better for me? Do I go out dancing or do I care for my body and go to sleep? Or like, what's more caring? I mean, we we have this. There's this within our in in our own self. Like, what am I going to value more? Like finishing that paper and turning it in, or sending that email so that I make it into the world of dance. So I get that gig or whatever. I'm more, you know, more recognized. Or am I going to go to sleep or take my, you know, do what I my body needs or what I'm really needing right now is to talk to a friend. Like, um. You know, like there's that in the personal realm, but in terms, in the studio, I was dealing with this in relationship to me as the role of choreographer and the dancers. So slowly through the years, I, that just started to go through a whole transformation that started with this kind of representation where I would put the dancers and myself all in this workers' uniforms and we would do the same and we would kind of, I was doing like the performance of the exhaustion and the labor of the body. And um, then, but slowly it's just with each work, it started, to, all of that started to fall away and I ended up, it, it ended up all feeling like a representation of ideas. So I've, where I've arrived is where choreography became for me, um, I started to question the, the, the need to even choreograph on people. Like it felt like the form, of, the form had to, the form had to be the idea, to separate the, the, to me like there should be no separation between the form and the politics of it, the ideology. So the form should, they all, the aesthetic and the, and the ideology I, I'm interested in that relation between aesthetic and ideology, so I felt like to be true to practice what I preach, I guess, <laughs> I had to simply practice um, allowing the, make, doing a practice together that was a, pra a healing, a self-healing practice. So we started to just practice together what I call the practice of being in pleasure. Um, so, um, once I, once we started to do that, I started to, the desire to make steps, and, and I don't want to, I don't mean in any way that there's anything wrong with that, but the form, the form that it took on was just this practice as, in the process is a, the, the ritual of coming, coming into the studio every time and doing the practice and then the work that is shown to an audience becomes the history of that process of us doing the, hist the accumulation of that history in our bodies and as a community. So I guess I should show the last, so we've been doing that, we did it in the street, I couldn't find right now one in the street, because also then we took it into the street and we would just do the practice of being pleasure in the street. Um, but I want to show a little bit of, I, I, we've done it just as a practice without music, but then in the last show, it's funny because you're, <laughs> you're right there. Yeah. It's a very, <laughs> uh, that was the night where I still came. This is a part way into, let me show from a little bit earlier in the piece. So the last piece I made, or we made together, yeah, every night is different and the, Sorry, I'm all over the place. Let me just play some of this. Oh, that's, hold on. practice with house music with a DJ um, so 
It also, um, in terms of like the relationship to care, I guess, and healing, to, I had um, my, my, my history of being in New York and dance, there was this parallel uh, between when I was taking a lot, studying um, release technique, I guess, postmodern technique, when I, what I came here for with Trisha Brown dancers and Victorian dancers and studying Alexander technique and Klein technique and starting to dance with choreographers and when I went out and seeing a lot of work um, and then I would go it was in my 20s long time ago now in the 90s and I and I would go out dancing to house parties and that's where I felt somehow that there was something where I always felt like this is dance church like that's like dance concert dance <laughs> and dance studies and I study and then I go here and this is where somehow some this I kept feeling like what's how do I connect this thing you know so there's another like Um, but uh, what do I, what do I, so, to me, there was there's. I feel like the spirit of house music for me was. Let me take this one. This is the last one, actually. So it just keeps through time. This practice of being in pleasure, I just call it the practice of being in pleasure. Pleasure is a complicated word, but it's simply that allowing oneself the possibility. It's the proposition to, that we make to ourselves that we are already in pleasure. So in a way, it's like a meditation practice. It's just being, it's, it's a resistance to producing too. It's, um, I feel like, uh, like I said, I didn't want to make any more, I, it, to, to bridge this gap between ritual and pleasure and the dance as a practice of becoming other than the expected embodiment in this society. I guess the dance is a, I feel like dance can be, to me, can be a practice of liberation of Sorry, uh, it, I feel right now it more than ever to it it a pro, it bring it can bring us bring us closer to a lost kind of magic or mystery or the mythical the the mystical this unknowable thing that is being in, being a body that we study and we research and we figure out what's best to eat and what what's more healthy or what you know we study like all the the studying of anatomy as a dancer too i started to resist and to kind of rebel against uh in the 90s that i was saying you know i love those forms uh the postmodern kind of forms but there is a kind of denial of, for me, there was a denial of sexuality, of the visceral, of, for me, I felt like I was erasing some of my Latino identity. Not that I'm so interested in this kind of style, ident not as identity politics, but in a sense, I think that that's, I, I identify with how you two were talking about it, uh, uh, this other identity and this shape-shifting more way that I feel like that is so much more complex and nuanced that in, in the memory than in the flesh. I mean, I often talk about when, I, when we do this kind of stuff of going into growing yourself back your tail, going into the memory, even in, in the DNA, when you were a fish, when you were, a, you know, when you were an, an animal and like taking your brain to your, to your crotch and where you poop and you like let that guide you. you know, it's I think 
that's what I also identify with what you were saying. I feel like to me the practice of being pleasure is, I call it a practice of becoming uncivilized also and decolonized because there is an assumption of being this body that is a civilized body, a way, a behave, a way of behaving that is still, I find, ruled by I think therefore I am, which is connected to the power structure of the white supremacist power structure. So I feel like, in a sense, this practice is a way, a little humble way of resisting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. I feel, I don't know. Um, I'm so honored. Um, so yeah, that was awesome. Um, I think the thing that kept coming up for me as the three of you were speaking um, was just the stuff around um, that I think each of you are, are, are taking on these radical tactics for survival in a um, toxic, white supremacist culture that, w that we live in. Um, and a, a thing that I'm interested in is how, and I think each of you spoke to this a bit, but how do these varying practices and ways of um, thinking and working and working through all of this stuff psychically, how, do, how does that um, play out day to day or in relationship to, um, yeah, in relationship to day-to-day, -day, in relationship to your communities, like how does it spread out or not? And how are you thinking about care in relationship to yourself? I feel like you each addressed that a little bit, but also in relationship to the communities that you're involved in. And, I mean, this is these are a lot of ideas, but also in relationship to the market that we all are either deciding to participate in um, or not. So, yeah, I know. I, I really want to give this example. It's been really, it's been on my mind, um, and I haven't really talked about it with anyone, but I went to the Dance NYC uh, panel discussion a few weeks ago on disability and race and intersectionality, um, and it was hosted by New York Live Arts. Um, so, Maybe to rewind a little bit is like, um, I've occupied a downtown dance world for many, many years. And it started out actually because I was recovering from an accident and I used a lot of te techniques in order to regain strength and get myself upright and not be reliant on painkillers. But as soon as I sort of started to get into a place of ability that was consumed by people who wanted me to perform for them in a way that was actually very ableist. And for many, many years, I didn't know that and I didn't have a vocabulary for disability at all, or the politics of that, or that you could be a dancer with a disability. And there doesn't have to be a narrative of overcoming in order to be uh, the, the thing. Uh, so, um, I emulated artists and choreographers who did things that I couldn't do, or I would push myself to, to do them at the expense of other parts of my life for a long time. And anyway, many years later, here I am at New York Live Arts for this panel, seeing a bunch of people from another community that I'm a part of, one that's not a part of the dance world, show up at at this lobby. A bunch of people in wheelchairs with many assistive devices who don't go to Nyla to see shows, who aren't part of the culture of artists that are pre presented there, are coming in, you know? And they are my community in a different world. So, and also it's like, maybe Nyla is ADA accessible, supposedly, but it's like everything uh, is, is kind of not quite right, mm -hmm. not quite accessible. You have to wait to get in the elevator. There's all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So finally, we're all like in a stu we're all in a dance studio. So me and my crip friends in wheelchairs that, who are not permitted into the able-bodied dan dance world are sitting in a dance studio to talk about 
disability. Um, so that alone for me was just a striking moment where I was like, I finally have uh, people from another home of mine in the city, uh, in this other home, that this other creative home for me, but actually we're not at home. Um, and that's been a very real cha challenge for me as I continue to make work in the world, um, to deal with is issues of accessibility and funding and visibility, uh, because actually most curators of dance in New York don't realize that there are dancers with disabilities and that that is a thing. So that you're not somebody who can't do something or you're a less than, but you're a person who does all of the, these things in your own form and that has a, an artistic value. That somebody who's able-bodied, who who's a, a Trisha Brown dancer, et cetera, could actually learn something from a person who has a different type of body. Um, so this has been in the forefront of my mind and I've been trying to like bridge these worlds in increasingly in my work because it's necessary for a lot of reasons and especially to go against like an, an ableist supremacist idea of what, what kinds of body are of value and why, who belongs, who's allowed to sur survive and be cared for. That's what I've been trying. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about just, um, especially in relationship to the dance world, showing up in the body that you are in, <laughs> wherever you're at, or wherever the people that you're in the room with are at, rather than this, oh, I'm going to, like you were talking about mimicking, or learning these like moves from these able-bodied choreographers. So many microphones. So I would I would love to talk, speak a little bit to postmodernism, because I feel like one of the elephants in the room is that I am one of those former Trisha Brown dancers. <laughs> and um, and I have a very like conflicting relationship to that as a um, another kind of embodied persona I shape shift in and out of. <laughs> um, and I actually brought something today. Maybe I'll pull it out. This is kind of amusing. <laughs> so, okay. Maybe you guys know this book, Inside the White Cube, The Ideology of the Gallery Space. So I'm gonna read just a little bit from a chapter where this kind of remarkable author, Brian O'Doherty, who's an artist but also a cultural critic um, and you know, engaged in his own kind of parafictional practice, uh, talks about modernism. <laughs> uh, okay. Couldn't modernism be taught to children as a series of Aesop's fables? It would be more memorable than art appreciation. Think of such fables as who killed illusion or how the edge revolted against the center the man who violated the canvas could follow, where did the frame go? It would be easy to draw morals, think of the vanishing in pasta that soaked away, and then come back, came back and got fat. And how would we tell the story of the little picture plane that grew up and got so mean? How it evicted everybody, including father perspective and mother space, who had raised such real nice children and left behind only this horrid result of an incestuous affair called abstraction, who looked down on everybody, including eventually its buddies, metaphor and ambiguity. So um, this is something that's been like a very real part of my practice, having like stepped into the spaces of postmodernism and performed those. Um, just these ideals of abstraction and what that does to somebody when um, you are being watched as a kind of object <laughs> uh, of study. And, um, and yet also all of the kind of like mercurial ways in which 
all of the artists that I've participated in from, it, from the Judson lineage also have their own kind of like wonderfully contradictory um, aesthetics, kind of like these aesthetics of refusal. Like they also refuse their own ways that they deny certain kinds of performativity. So being in the studio with someone like Trisha Brown and all the ways in which she always was also contradicting the things that, the, these kind of like ideals that were being held up. Um, and, but what's interesting is in the last year or so of dancing in that work, I um, wanted to, to go to clown school. <laughs> And part of it was like this kind of oppressive feeling of, of being asked to like wear this neutral mask and um, to move like rectilinear lines and joints that fold, bend, and extend, but nothing else, and, um, and, and so on and so on. Uh, and so anyway, after that I started working in clown and then started going into the New York City house community also and studying with the voguing community. And so it's been this kind of interesting process of trying to um, understand these, these like oppressive tendencies of abstraction, <laughs> how they wear upon our bodies. So. I, I want, that, that makes me think of, uh, there was, because I, I too, in a sense, came to New York to study that, those forms and, I think I remember being really interested in the fact that that was that was a reaction. Uh, that that was very influenced by this kind of Eastern thinking. So there's a, there there is an original kind of beautiful intention, right? That isn't a fascist kind of erasure, but in a sense that I when it at a certain point, it makes me think of, because we're talking also about self-care, and I, I feel in my own, you were asking about your own and your community, and I feel like parallel to this transformation as an artist that I've gone through, um, as a person, I guess, and I, one thing is trying to not separate everything so much, is to have things become the same, life and art, and not compartmentalize, and, uh, Meditation has is something that I feel like is something I I can't say I do it every day I I strive to but uh, it's something that I feel is a way a form of self care and me, but there's so many ways of doing it right and one somehow I I connected with the neutral body this idea of the neutral body or the abstraction of this form this kind of postmodern. Uh, way of that that is more that seems that there's a observation that somehow it's connected to this Eastern practice, right? That of this kind of Buddhist or this kind of thing that seems like you're so elevated that you're beyond emotion or feeling or like you're, you're kind of beyond that. There's almost like a, this beauty that has a spirituality to it, this elevated thing that, um, I don't know, I'm, I, somehow I feel like, I often feel like the, the idea of abstraction in art is connected, there, there's some connection in there with abstraction and spirituality and some kind of being beyond this mundanity of the, somehow I want to talk about like, the, you know, the flesh and the, the guts. And f for me now that I somehow, I, I reacted against that because it felt like it was a lie. It felt like just like ballet can be a kind of um, impo in position of a kind of truth that seems absolutist and, um, just, just like this is the truth, this is the be this is beauty. Then postmodernism and it's like release, you know, it can be another form of that, and another kind of imposition like that. So I reacted against that, but then I, I find myself being really attracted to Buddhism now at this point in my life because of my own personal, emotional <laughs> life history issues that I feel like it's oh, something I ended up being attracted to as a form of self-care. And, but what I realized is that 
the way, it's not a meditation where you're observing yourself, breathing work, where you're removing yourself from it. But it's, what, I, what I've been interested in is, oh, how do you become the breathing? It's the experiential, it's like, it's not being a slave to this, it's not being, it's being aware of it. It's kind of like this interpretation of Alexander technique where people, some people study a lot of Alexander and you see them and they never bend their spine or something. They're like always like so free in the head. I don't know if most of you know about the Alexander technique, you know, releasing your head off of your spine. And, and I mean, I'm not gonna define Alexander technique right now, but <laughs> what I mean is, there's something that happens that it's like the form, the, the intention and the ideas and the philosophy of something and then it becomes a form and the substance of it becomes taken out of it. It's like vacuous or something. Or it's an, I feel like, I, uh, what's, uh, what's Steve Baxton, I, I heard he talked about how even contact improv had become, it's like it started as this really radical political, Thing, and now it, somehow what remains is just this form that's almost like, you know. Anyway. Right, and is, is, there a, is there a practice or a way of moving through the world that keeps us in unknowing and keeps us in magic and keeps us in a slippery um, space of always becoming and what, I mean, question mark. And, and is there, I mean, that's what I'm curious about in terms of your specific practices actually is because I think I think there's something that you all are doing that is staying connected to that. Um, uh, yeah, and also, you know, like as the form becomes or as the thing becomes solidified, does it just become another thing and does it have to do that in order to stay in a radical space? I don't know. I'm, I don't know. I feel like they both, you both talked about what I was talking about now that is a non separation of the form form as an object or as separate from your life and from your form of yourself, your disability becoming your form. Like you were talking about clown therapy. I, I feel like the way I was working with the group I was working with, with the practice of being in pleasure is, it's like group therapy. I mean, it does become like therapy. It is, and I feel like I, it was like what got me through what I was going through and I don't know, it was like, um, I feel often, I swear I didn't do that. Um, um, I'm in the mystery. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, it, this is confusing, I think, a little bit because, um, because there is what you do for your own self-care, and there is a being in the studio as being therapeutic, which I deeply feel. And I feel for myself that now I have a practice of tending to my pain in the studio. I, and I actually, I used to like um, leave, if I had to walk to the studio with my cane to like get up the subway steps, I'd get in the studio and I'd put my cane against the wall and pretend like it wasn't there. And be like, I'm a dancer now. But then I, I was still in pain the whole time. So I was in denial of my body. So now I bring the cane into the studio, and I'm with the cane. Um, and that's how I'm also working with other bodies in the studio, that the pain and complexity is real, and that can create an aesthetic experience. But I, what I, um, I wanted to go back to say even though I might have a therapeutic experience in the studio, I might not want to make my performance work therapeutic um, because of a lot of reasons. Because I was born into a female body, however, I don't fully identify with that now. So there's always this projection, for, to me at least, of uh, being a caretaker ta ta or holding a space for, for, for people or having their things pr projected on me that I'm expected to fulfill, which I'm not interested in. 
And then I'm not interested in showing my pain or disability in a way that's going to like only make me look like a victim or have somebody pity me or say, oh, I felt so bad or I identify mm -hmm. less. It's like, so it takes time to figure out aesthetically um, f to, to me what I want to show and what is just for me in the process. I mean, I have watched you like travel with your crotch over a speaker that I was sitting next to that. And it was just like this gorgeous, fierce, like experience. You, you were, you were you, but you were another being, you know, and like that was a transformational space. And there was no, there was no other ver version of you. That was like you, you know. I feel a little bit more like I want to compartmentalize some things mm -hmm. to yeah. make it safe or something. I'm just thinking <laughs> <laughs> so much. Um, Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to you guys for being here and sharing your practices with us, and thank you to the Siegel Center and to Anja and Prelude for bringing a conversation about self-care into a graduate center where that's not really a thing we talk about a lot. Um, so true. And, and especially care and the body is like really not something that we talk about a lot in this building, and I would know because I'm here every day. <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, this is radical work. I, I also want to talk about, like it's really interesting. I've been researching for the Dance Space Project Lost and Found platform, um, which is upcoming, through the Center for Humanities, which is a center here. And I've gotten to do a lot of really amazing archival work, in particular on John Byrne, who died of AIDS. Um, and one of the fascinating things that I found in his um, archive is that he started practicing releasing with Yvonne Meyer. She was um, doing, she was teaching Skinner releasing without authorization um, in open movement at PS122. And he had been diagnosed at the time with they didn't know what, they thought it wasn't GRID because um, he didn't have Carbozy sarcoma or new system pneumonia, but they thought it was a virus. Ha ha, it turns out it was. Um, and he, when he started taking steroids and feeling better, went into the studio and like danced it the fuck out and then injured himself. And then Yvonne was teaching releasing and he started practicing and that became like the, the major practice um, for his self care from there until the end of his life. Um, and that kept, was able to keep him moving and creating, which also became a very material need for him because he no longer could maintain his day job. And this was a time when you could still get grants as an individual artist, which he was getting. Um, and so his only income was either through like friends giving him money or any grants. Um, and so he needed to produce to live. Um, and, and, so, and so then, right, and my understanding of Trisha Brown as well is that like releasing came into her world like via injury. Um, and, and so then like how quickly that by the 1990s, this had become reified and ossified as an abstract process, practice, right, for its aesthetic components um, rather than understood as a self-care practice, as a healing practice, as a practice for care, healing, disability, illness, death, right? And, um, and, and has at this point become, right, like a calling card of your like hip credentials, right? Like I'm cool because I know about releasing and I can do it at movement research at Dixon Church, right? Um, so I just think that that's really fascinating the way that this, this practice has become absolutely disembodied 
right? It's, it's exactly, Luciana, what you're talking about, what we need to bring back to our dancing, our, our full materiality. It's become dematerialized as an abstract, as Corey was saying, aesthetic, um, which is very oppressive. And I guess I have this question about like whether or not we could rematerialize and re-radicalize release. The other elephant in the room is that I'm also an Alexander Tech teacher. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, I, this is, I think, a really important conversation that needs to be happening around the education of any somatic practice. Um, I actually came to the work when I was 12 because I had such a debilitated, tating injury I couldn't really walk. Uh, and I had tried many different things, and I was lucky enough to live in Southern California where there were things like the Alexander Technique around. Um, and so for me, when I met that work, it was really a kind of survival practice. And uh, what's been interesting is to have had this engagement with it since I was 13 years old, and now to have had ways in which um, I, I refuse aspects of it, and then ways in which I'm still connected to parts of the form. And I think one of the things that, that's really challenging about talking about these, these kinds, kind of systems of education uh, that also can turn into ideologies or turn into aesthetic practices um, is also the way, in, I have a few different thoughts, I'm gonna try to unpack them, not, take, not taking too long. Um, is the way also things can become codified as they're passed on. And when that wasn't necessarily an intention of the practice. And, uh, you know, from kind of going into Trisha's work and the voguing community and the clown community and the Alexander community, all these different communities, there is one, one aspect that I have um, experienced that's in common. And it's around this idea of emergent improvisational practices. And I do feel like there are certain uh, ways in which to, to sort of authentically enter an emergent system. You are entering into the unknown. And, um, and that that is a practice of entering into the unknown that needs to be engaged to, to really be able to do the Alexander Technique and all these other forms. But then over time, sometimes these things get uh, yeah, historicized in certain ways that where it wasn't in necessarily intended. Um, so one of the ways I've kind of unpacked some of those problematic aspects for myself has been to situate myself in these different lineages so that I can really challenge my own assumptions and the kinds of language, language I use when I also teach these forms and, and so on. Uh, but I think this, anyways, like a really kind of topic unto itself that is really important to unpack. <laughs> I agree. I'm glad that the conversation is going here. We, Corey and I spend a lot of time <laughs> talking about this <laughs> um, over dinner. But um, I, I also, I'm, I'm also thinking of uh, improvisation, like emphasis on improvisational practice and that as a radical practice actually, um, and this idea of play and that I feel like many of these forms um, come out of a place of play and come out of this, these like emergent practices that you're talking about. Um, and there's um, a commitment to being in flux. And I think in relationship to self-care, I'm also thinking about like, that that is also in flux, like how we define self-care might one day or minute be about like going to work and, and making a certain amount of money so that you can calm your adrenals down, you know, and put some money in the bank. Or maybe another day it's like going to acupuncture, another day it's having sex, another day it's, like, you know, being inside a movement practice. But that, like, I think also self care can get caught up, language around self care can get really codified, um, especially as it comes in relationship to like the market and capitalism. So I feel also because like, like, what if you need to collapse? Right. What if actually what you need to do yeah. in the middle of your Alexander class, you know, is actually have an emotional collapse because yeah. you are traumatized yeah. and you are yeah. going through something. And you're not going to be able to release your way out of it and manage it and then go to your <laughs> rehearsal and then look beautiful. Or 
yes. you know, pretend to be white or pretend to be straight or pretend to be whatever the fuck. I just, yeah, it's like totally. self-care can look cute, but actually it's not, it's not, being alive is not cute. <laughs> and I feel like what we're trying to get at are practices that are not cute. <laughs> Preach, girl. <laughs> There. <laughs> I thought it sounded loud. Um, something I was trying to say in the beginning, and I never got to it, was that the, I was for a while, and I, I'm still interested in the question of um, how, uh, in the, this kind of fantasy as a maker of healing the audience, too. Because it's like the, our practice of self care, but also within that, um, like, I mean, when you were saying, well, no, I want to compartment, it's like, I don't want to, that's kind of a self-care, but it's also a choice of how to, how is the, how do you want to use, how do you want your work to function in relation to the audience, right? So for me, I, I've chosen to, to, to treat it as with this fantasy, I, I start to, uh, I'm interested in a kind of transparency. Like I guess, I guess in a, in a way, what I need is often to, th th I feel like in ter my, my survival, in my survival, I can't, it, it takes too much energy to pretend that I have really clear boundaries because I don't. I mean, sometimes I'm learning that I have, <laughs> This is too much information, but in my personal life, I'm learning I need to have more boundaries, but I'm interested in continuing to not have any boundaries in my work because there, because it takes way too much energy and like it exhausts me to put boundaries because it, it's, it's really hard for me to do that. My, my tendency is I just want to be completely transparent. And, you know, so in my work, I start to be more transparent about the fact that really what I think I'm doing or what I feel like I want to do or it's a fantasy or whatever is to be a healer so that I, if I'm really honest with myself, I think I'm some kind of shaman or something so when I'm making work. So I'm just going to take that role on fully and just become it and believe that I'm going to heal the audience. So. I don't know, I just wanted to speak about that, like the healing, that, that in a sense, are we, are we not, like what do we really believe that we're doing when we're, because it's not, really it's not just a therapeutic, there's something therapeutic in the studio practice, but there is a choice of doing it for an audience too, or having a relationship too. So what is that relationship? Is it a market? I'm, I'm more and more interested, although I did, do need to make some money and put it in the bank to continue to pay rent, and really, like, I haven't been able to pay rent this month, for example. Uh, but <laughs> more too much information. Uh, but that's part of self-care, like the whole thing of like, how do you, it's a survival thing, how do you make work? How do you, I'm not gonna pretend anymore I can afford to have this whole process like this, so. I'm just going to be completely transparent because that's the only way I can keep making work. It's just making it work into the fabric of my life. Otherwise, I have to stop. Yeah, and I think there's a thing around this like emotional laboring um, associated with all the different things we've been talking about. And I think part of what you're saying reminds me of that. Just this, like, how do we um, see when we're doing a lot of extra emotional and psychic labor? to accommodate, I mean, especially someone who's in a female body, like what does that look like? How are we, so, you know, that's a whole other conversation, but um, yeah, that came up for me too, listening to that. Um, I think we need to wrap up soon-ish. 10 minutes. Okay, I need glasses, I can't really read that. Seconds, minutes, yeah.
You know, I'm really very curious to understand what you're, you're saying. I don't know what cute means. You have to describe that for me. But, um, <laughs> because you don't want to be cute. And I think, what, what do you mean by cute? Like a cute puppy? Or anyway, so I'm wondering about that. <laughs> but it seems to me that what you're saying is like to have a spiritual help. Um, you know, because dancing is wonderful to, you know, to dance. And that's, the, that's, I think, the closest place that we ever become very into ourselves because we'd fall down if we weren't in touch with ourselves, you know, when, when we're dancing. I, I feel that. But when you, it's spiritual. So how do you make this, to say, taking care of this physical body, physical therapy, and that kind of, and that's where Alexander and all of it, you know, they sort of put them to that place. Anyway, I'm trying to understand, this is all relatively new to me, even though I did dance, but it was a time, and then you dance for other, you dance, sometimes you say you want to express yourself, but sometimes you're expressing what somebody else wants you to express. You know, it's through your body, you're the, you're the um, violin like, the piece, you know, the music is coming through. So it's, it's very complex, and I just would like to clarify it a little bit, if possible. We have like 30 seconds, so I think I'm really pushing it with that one, but do any of you want to? I mean, I think one thing that I'm sort of gathering from hearing everybody speaking tonight is, is also just this idea that um, care doesn't necessarily look one particular way or have an aesthetic, and yet being able to enter um, sometimes into aesthetics where you're following uh, some kind of generative impulse around your own interests or your own creative embodiment is another kind of form of care. Um, I know for me, clown therapy is one of the ways I take care of my body, um, and it's been what an intent. Oh, what I was showing the video from, clown it's therapy. Clown therapy yeah. And I intentionally slump, and I intentionally let myself do all the wrong things that are not part of the Alexander Technique, for example, but because it's um, fulfilling some kind of way that I'm working through trauma, it, I leave and I feel like I've, I've gone to physical therapy. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's just one example, but I think, it, I think what you're saying is, is that it is tremendously complex, and there's maybe not uh, one particular aesthetic or practical way, you know, et cetera. There's a Nietzsche quote, I, did, I cannot believe in a god who can't dance. I love that, because I think that is kind of very interesting. Okay. And Q? <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm talking about beauty. Oh. The way that we culturally take beauty for granted and consume it and what that, the, the, the weight of that I'm talking about whatever the antithesis of that might look like as actually having value. Thank you. Did any of you have last thoughts before we close? I, I would say really quickly that I think that maybe that trying, that it can, that to shift towards uh, d uh, the practice of dancing as a, as a self-care rather than an imposed idea of a way of being that can actually be an injured, you know, it can be something that can hurt. <laughs> it's when you're trying to put yourself into an idea or a truth. But when you're just letting, like you were saying, sometimes self-care is like collapsing, so. Being the being in the body that it, that needs that needs to be that the attention. Yeah, and this I in my practice I feel like I'm trying to listen to the flesh, the tissue, let let it not have an idea of a, not not any form, letting the thing tell you the. Yeah. We need to end. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your time.